um, be recorded for the purpose of being able to remind ourselves of some of the key lessons, of being able to go back and experience it. And in some cases, we share these pieces with people who really have not been able to, to be here, but want to get the benefit of, of the connection. Um, and with that, over to you, Melissa. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to see um, some familiar, um, friendly faces and some new faces. And I believe that we also have uh, people joining us from New Zealand today. Um, myself, I'm in the UK and for once I think it's hotter here than it is there where you are. We're at 30 de de degrees today, so woohoo! Um, and I also think we have other people joining us from the UK. So welcome everybody from wherever you are. I hope you can all hear me very clearly. Um, so just before I introduce you to Isabel, just a couple of house rules in terms of when Isabel's speaking. If you do have any questions, please pop them in the chat um, and then we'll facilitate the questions and bring them into the conversation afterwards. And um, without further ado, let me just give a little brief in, uh, introduction to Isabel Ferreira. So I have known Isabel Ferreira now for I think it may be eight, nine, ten years, not quite sure. Um, a wonderful lady who has worked um, tirelessly, endlessly in the trauma and uh, grief space throughout many, many years of her life. I won't tell you how many. And she's here today to share with you, um, your yeah, looking at grief, especially in these times of COVID, um, it's going to be a, a, a good, difficult session. So please get yourselves ready and um, I'll hand you over to Isabel. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you everyone for having me today. It's a real honor and a real pleasure. Although the subject is not an easy one, um, I'm sure that we can all learn from it. And I really hope that um, as you listen, that you look into yourself because loss and grief affect us all in one way or the other. And um, I think that loss and grief have got life altering repercussions. The thought of losing a loved one, the thought of losing our precious homes, the thought of losing our freedom is terrifying. But those are not easy conversations to have, are they? So we do what I call the touch wood approach to it. It's also what some parents say to me, bereaved parents that will say, you know what, since my child died, it feels like I've got some infectious disease because people shy away from me. And that's because when confronted with it, we have to look at our own losses, at the possibility of loss. And that's very hard. Death will come to us all. It will knock on everybody's door. But not on my door. That's the attitude that we usually take. Not now. And our now goes on and on forever. Because it's so hard to look at. But all of a sudden, those conversations are being had all over the world. COVID, COVID took us all by surprise. We feel confused. We feel disoriented. And it's very hard to normalize the present, but also to look at the future and try to reframe it with any sort of certainty or even with hope. Lives are being lost. Jobs are being lost. Our routines and our plans have all but dissolved. So we fear. We fear for our lives. We fear for those of our loved ones. We fear for the world. The whole world right now is mourning simultaneously. So I think I just used the word mourn. And I did that purposely. It's actually not the correct word. We are grieving simultaneously. So it's very important 
that we look at some definitions and we're going to go please to our first slide because it's very important that we think what is loss what is grief what is bereavement so let's look at that definition slide the next one thank you so loss comes from the old English word loss. It means destruction, it means deprivation, it means dissolution. It's a fact that happens to us. Something happens, that's a loss. I suffered a loss. It's an action, a state that happens to us. It's also the death of a person. If we compare that to grief, grief is a reaction so we suffer a loss and we grieve as a reaction of that loss it's a universal experience everyone will go through it it's very natural but it's also very unique the way you grieve the way i grieve we may be grieving the same person but we do it in different ways so that's grief and loss. And then we've got mourning. Mourning is a state of being. We are actually, sorry, I'm, that's not a state of being, that's a bereavement. So let me just do the bereavement. Bereavement is a state of being, okay? I am not, I cannot say I was bereaved. I am bereaved. We're still on the definitions. If we lose someone, we can never say, I was bereaved once upon a time. We stay bereaved. So bereavement is a state of being. Mourning, on the other hand, is the, re the unconscious or conscious psychological processes that we go through after bereavement. So it's an outward expression of grief. It's um, very culturally or socially uh, influenced. And for example, the way a person mourns or shows in the UK that they are mourning may be very different to one that comes from um, the, the Portugal or Spain, and it will be very different from one that comes from South Africa, for example. So one will be more circumspect in the MENA, uh, another one will wear black for a long time, another one will um, sing or um, have a more vocal show of their grief, but the mourning itself is that expression of the grief, is the processes that we go through, okay? So if we go to the next slide, so we may, while we go to the next slide, we may, we lose a life, we lose a limb, we lose a house, we lose a job. Those are all types of, of loss. But the death of a loved one is the one that we usually go to first, isn't it? We think loss, someone died. Maybe a child. It may be a parent. It may be a grandparent, a sibling. It doesn't matter, but that's where we always go to when we think of loss. It can always be also a serious disability. That's a loss of independence. It's not death. It's loss of autonomy as is serious or terminal illness. What about divorce? There's a loss of identity. There's a loss of status. There is so much retirement. Rape. There's a loss of dignity. You see, there is so many different faces, but, and then there's the death of a pet. And I put that there because I always tell this, little anecdote which just exemplifies the importance of loss to the individual. So many years ago someone said to me, I know exactly how you feel. I lost my cat two weeks ago and I was incensed. I was so angry. How dare you? How dare you compare your loss to mine? Now, many years later, I can reflect on that with compassion. 
with empathy. That pet was possibly that person's family. It was a source of comfort and com company. What do I know? But we are so quick to dismiss other people's losses because they don't look and don't, don't feel to us as big as ours. So that's why I put these losses on the first slide because they are physical, they are tangible, they are quantifiable. But then there are other types of loss that are not as easily recognized, but it does not mean that they are less serious, that they are less real or less valid. What about the sense of safety and security? What about loss of control? A loss of routine, loss of freedom. What about loss of exercise and worship? We think, oh, really? Seriously? Yes. Because we form attachments not just to people, but to things as well. And when those attachments are so suddenly snapped, we grieve. What about school and, and, and play? Our children are grieving and they don't have the words, but their reactions, their behavior show it. And I beg you, if you've got children, small children that still cannot uh, verbalize why they're playing up, why they're being angry, why they're sitting in a corner without energy, just ask. And if they say, I'm sad, I want my friends over, we cannot distract. Please don't say, let's go and play, let's go and watch TV. Just say, I understand, it must be really difficult. Because the moment you say, it's okay, you can have them when this is over. You can go back to school when this is over. We are minimizing it, we're giving them, we're telling them we don't have the right to feel that way. And as adults and as parents, we need to model good grief to our children. Grief is hard. And the earlier we learn to deal with it, it's okay to be sad. It's okay to be angry about something that has upset you so much. So school and free play, for our children right now are a great loss. Celebrations, weddings, how many weddings have been postponed? What about funerals? Is this starting to sound like grief loss, uh, to grief uh, related to COVID? Are we all experience some of those at least? Fear of mortality. Fear of lack, which is so real. We see jobs being lost all around us. And my company is retrenching. Maybe I'm going to be next. Not being able to freely plan ahead. All these are valid. You cannot quantify them as easily. You cannot, they're not physical. They're more abstract. Does that mean that they are risk? less real. Do you feel them? If you feel the sadness relating to it, if you feel the sorrow relating to it, oh yeah, it's grief, okay. Okay, so I thought it was important to differentiate between the more concrete and the more abstract losses. And can we now go to the next slide that tells us of types then of grief and some of them are self-explanatory anticipatory grief we know someone is very ill we know they're going to die um, sometimes we prepare we have time to prepare for their death other times it's actually a complication because we have time to think about other secondary losses that we are not ready yet to confront there is delayed grief. There is complicated grief, unresolved. There's a very fine line. 
between normal grief and complicated grief. So we've got a tendency to pathologize immediately, or oh, this person needs an antidepressant, or that person uh, has to go for therapy. Not necessarily. We need time to hold those emotions, sit with them, feel them. There's traumatic bereavement. And we think car accidents, we think murder, we think um, suicide. Yes, but what about rape and sexual assault? That is a traumatic bereavement. Ambiguous grief. That's us right now. COVID is ambiguous. It's sort of murky. Um, usually related more to missing persons or to dealing with a, a loved one that has got Alzheimer's. We're grieving that person as they were. But what about COVID-19? What about the situation that we're living on, that we're having to deal with so many losses that are not easily recognized by others? We are suffering from ambiguous grief right now. And then to end, the, the types of grief is disenfranchised grief. And that is grief that is actually not, uh, there is a stigma to it. It's not uh, recognized at all because um, it could be a gay couple that has not uh, come out. People are not aware of the relationship or an illicit affair. A, a partner dies and will think, that's a very big manifestation of grief for someone that has lost a friend or it is losing a pet as well but there is another very important one that i'd like you all to remember and that is perinatal loss miscarriage even an elective abortion is painful is truly painful and a lot of people will say things to you like, but you chose to do it. Or you didn't have a bond with the baby. And we feel that I'm alone in this. So disenfranchised grief needs our attention, needs us as a society and as a support system to really pay attention to. The next slide the factors influence in the grief experience now there's a long list but we'll go through them quickly age is very important it could be the age of the person who died and it could be the age of the person who suffered the loss so for example uh, a father a young father with small children has died that loss is going to be experienced by the young children differently than if I lose my parents at age 50 or 60. On the other hand, if we lose a mother at a very young age, the way that she helps define our personality, that she nurtures us, is going to be very different than um, a sibling that has lost someone at age 50. So they're both in their 50s and now one dies. The reactions are very different. So age is very, very important. But again, please, I always ask, never minimize anyone's loss. How often are we said, even now, in, time, in these times that we are experiencing, so-and-so died of COVID. Oh, but but he was old or but he had a comorbidity there's no buts in loss we feel it in the same way so if someone says to us so and so died never a but my loss is important and we need to reassure that person that it matters regardless of age the role of the deceased in the family the nature and meaning of that loss. Again, a young child losing a mom or an older person, a spouse 
losing his wife or a husband. Past experience of loss. There is something we call loss overwhelm. If you lose a person after another, after another, and I heard this week about a lady who has lost in the space of, in the last 12 months, she had already lost a child and she has now lost another two plus her husband because of COVID. That is completely overwhelming, but yet they have to carry on for the sake of the grandchildren. It is incredibly painful. We need to be present for those people. What about unfinished businesses? Sorry about that. There are so many unfinished businesses right now. People are dying alone. People are dying. We cannot go and visit them. We don't have the opportunity for those, I am sorry. I love you. Forgive me. Afterwards, it's so much more difficult to cope with our grief if there are unfinished businesses. Sudden versus expected death is a big factor. Coping skills and personality, we will talk about later. Death surround, again, is very important. And we think a murder, a suicide, a car crash, we have an idea of what the surround was like, even if we were not present. With COVID, sometimes it's what we think happened around the death of someone who dies in hospital with, with us not being able to visit. What did it look like? And we paint these pictures in our minds that often are so much more terrifying of the reality. So when we try to do what we call the work of grief and sit with our memories and reminisce, instead of thinking of the person, which is a healthy way of doing it, our brain goes to the trauma of it, which is the death surround. So that is also very, very important. And lastly, it's the perception of the preventability of death. Should I have seen it before? Should I have seen the signs? Should I have taken him or her to the doctor first or before? All those things will greatly influence the way that we experience our loss. Thank you. We can go to our next one. Social, ah, social support. It's not just the social support. Are, are we willing to accept that support? And that is so true of us now with the lockdown. Although it has been eased, I cannot go and just sit with my friend and vent. I cannot just go and have a lunch out without feeling afraid. So the things may be there, but am I taking opportunity of the support that is available? Social, cultural and religious um, backgrounds or faith backgrounds are a great source of support. And right now, we are being denied that to a great extent because of the no gathering, okay? Educational and economic factors, the use of rituals. Where are those now? Where are the wakes? Where are the big funerals that we, we like to have and that are important because lowering a coffin onto the ground or having a cremation, sitting shiver, all those things help us confront and integrate the reality of the death. In the early days of death, I usually say that our brain takes a leave of absence because the absence, because the reality is so difficult to deal with that it sort of, I'm out of here for a while and then it takes bites of the reality one little bit at a time. But that funeral or that cremation, that church service helps us to actually confront the reality, and that's absent right now. And then the physical 
influences, which is the health, our state of health right now, the use of drugs or sedatives, and that means, am I on anything, any tablet that might impact the way I grieve? So if a person is on anti-anxiety medication or on antidepressants, it may mask slightly, for a time at least, the, the symptoms of grief. And doctors, bless them, I, they, sometimes they want to help. All they want is to make it better for you. And they will offer that. And there will always be a place for medication in grief if the person needs it, if the person needs that extra help. But sometimes it does tend to postpone a little the work of grief. And then, of course, self-care. We all know about self-care. But when you suffered a loss that is so painful, sometimes we don't want to engage in self-care. It could be because I think I don't want to live anymore. It's a slow suicide. Or it could be, I don't deserve to. Or it could be any form of pleasure is, is not good. My mom or my sister or my friend died. Okay, So we, we don't afford ourselves those pleasures from a misplaced guilt. Let's go to the next one. And now, if I said the previous one was long, the possible symptoms of grief is even longer, but we're going to go through them quickly. I promise you. And I will try to keep time. On the cognitive side, confusion, poor memory and concentration. Are we able to concentrate as we usually do right now during these times? I know I'm not. I struggle. It's like I've got little butterflies in my brain. I start to do something and I forget. It's age, okay, but it's also the situation we're living now, the abnormal situation that we are living now. A lack of decision-making abilities. Some of us have got more time of our hands, but we're doing less. We're sitting more. In the beginning of lockdown, we had great ideas. I'll do this, I'll do that. And then we got tired. There is no motivation for it anymore. Nightmares, flashbacks. Then on the physical side, shortness of breath. A tight chest, sighing. I don't know about you, but I'm sighing a lot. Palpitations, intimacy issues. That's a very important one. Again, because if when we suffer the loss of a loved one, what one partner may perceive as comfort, the other one may see as a betrayal of the person they lost. So there's going to need to be a talk, a real good, open, honest conversation around that issue. Exhaustion. Muscular pains and headaches, a weakened immune system. We can help ourselves, okay? We need to be willing to. The next one will be the emotional grief symptoms on the next slide. And that's the anxiety. Feelings of detachment. Is this really happening? The suicide ideation. And where this is concerned, it's very important to remember that after the loss, after a painful life-altering loss, suicide is a common thought. Not all people who think about it will go on to take their lives. But we need to be aware. If we have someone in our family in our social group who has lost a loved one recently, particularly with loss of a child, that there is no plan. And we need to explore. I just want to die. Have you thought about it? What did you think about it? What would you do? Those are hard conversations, but they are very, very important ones. Anger. I don't know about you, but I like anger. Anger is energizing, isn't it? 
When you feel really mad about something, wow, we get a surge of energy, all that adrenaline. In the long run, it's exhausting. But it's our default button because of that surge of energy. So in the beginning, when we, are, when we lose something or someone, we get angry. And that's okay. Get angry at the person, the drunk driver that killed your spouse. Get angry at the person who murdered your friend. But try to see what that anger is telling you and where it is pointing. Get angry at the God that you believe in. That's okay. It's big enough to take it. But watch out for when the anger turns inwards. Then we need to work on that. Okay? There is a place for counselors and for therapists. Fear of our own and our family's mortality. Depression, relief. And it's very strange to say relief in the context of death and loss, but think of someone who had a, a family member with, that suffered from addiction over many years, the turmoil, the conflict. When that person dies, they're not relieved that he's dead. They relieve that the situation is over, but it often feels the same. It's difficult to separate the two. Guilt and self-blame. Aren't we all guilty of feeling guilty? I think as women, we are natural nurturers. We want to make it everything better for everybody. So when we are not able to, we feel that guilt. Or we blame ourselves for things that can be completely irrational. And the head knows it, but the heart lags behind. So we need to hold it. We need to hold that guilt until maybe eventually it becomes so heavy that it just falls naturally. Okay? Longing, sorrow and despair. That is very obvious and the next slide is on the behavioral side social withdrawal at the time we need it the most many times we withdraw and grief loss is about being present and we'll go into the coping skills later but it's very important and we remember why do I want to be alone? And solitude is good. It's good for the soul. But when it is to ruminate, instead of being still, of using the stillness to nurture us, then we need to think about it and do it differently. Recklessness, sleeping and eating disorders. I think we all, to a great extent, going through that right now. Risky behaviors. Blame of others. Instead of blaming ourselves, we blame the doctor. We blame the hospital. We blame our political leaders, anyone. But we need to put the blame at the door of someone. Aggression and crying. I love crying. I don't love it like, oh, I'm going to do it purposely. But it's wonderful. We think of crying as a weakness. It's a great strength and we need to start recognizing it as such. On the spiritual side, why? Why me? Why him or her? Why like this? And all those questions can actually make us have a faith crisis or it can bring us closer to our faith. What I found in my experience is that there will be some crisis in the early days of grief and loss, but in time, faith becomes a source of solace again. Or, the same, by the same token, an existential crisis. What's the use? What's the use of being here? What's the use of life? What does it all mean? Okay? 
So these are just some of the symptoms. The list is endless and as individual as you are. There are many theories around grief and loss. And we're gonna to go to the next slide. Because that's what I really want to talk more about. We understand easily the concepts of the symptoms and the behaviors and the factors that influence the way we grieve. And theories have got a place, but I want to talk about something specific. Um, I'll just read this, learn your theories and learn them well, but put them aside when you touch a loving soul. And that's a fact with grief. There are many, but they are applicable to some, to some circumstances and others we do not connect with at all. But I like to take a bit of everyone. So already from Freudian times when you wrote about grief and melancholia, that's possibly one of the earliest, if not the earliest, um, Kubler-Ross's stages of grief. And we, I think we all know about Kubler-Ross's stages. The five stage that she wrote about, it's the shock and denial, it's the anger, it's the depression, it's the bargaining, it's the acceptance in the end. The reality is that she wrote them for the dying, not for dealing with grief after death. So for the person to prepare themselves for death, I will go through anger, I will go, I will bargain, I will get depressed about it. Eventually I'll accept that I'm going to die. And I always had a problem with that acceptance full stop and that's why i want to go into another one a little bit more i must just tell you that although a lot of people are aware of this theory a lot are not aware of the fact that it's not a linear process we can go back and forth and back and forth take three steps forward and two right back and it's okay Okay, as long as there is movement. In my grief journey, I actually often thought I'm on Groundhog Day. I'm going on a loop over and over and over again, the same thing. Okay. Wardens, the tasks of the bereaved, the dual process, they're all good theories. But there is something called the continuing bonds theory. And that's what I'd like to focus on, as well as the last one, which is David Kessler's meaning. So with continuing bonds, if we look at Kubler-Ross and acceptance, what then? Is it, as I said before, a full stop? How do I live? in a world when my, where my loved one is absent. What am I gonna do? Is this the end of life as I knew it? How do I carry on? Continuing bonds, the goal of it is to help us, help the bereaved redefine a sense of wholeness that includes memories, of the person that we've lost. So it's, um, it's an, like an inner representation of that person that we carry within us. That is a part of us always. It's not a physical relationship. It's a spiritual one, but that does not make it less real. I can have a relationship with the parent I lost or the child I lost or the friend I lost, despite the fact that they are not here. Diedrich, I always have to look up his name because I forget. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, he was, he lost many people, many loved ones um, in Nazi Germany. 
and he was very well acquainted with loss. And he called this, this type of continuing bond, although he didn't give it the name, making space for the deceased in our lives, making space on that spiritual side of us. He called it the gap. And I'm actually going to read a quote from him because I love it. I love what he said. So I'll quickly read it. Nothing can make up for the absence of someone we love, and it would be wrong to try and find a substitute. We must simply hold on, hold out, and see it through. That sounds very hard at first, but at the same time, it is a great consolation for the gap as long as it remains unfilled, preserves the bonds between us. It is nonsense to say that God fills the gap. God does not fill it. On the contrary, he keeps it empty and so helps us to keep alive our former, former communion with each other, even at the cost of pain. I just love it. Even at the cost of pain. Can we escape pain when we lose someone? Not that if we are human. So if we keep that space in our minds, in our hearts, if we foster those bonds with our loved one, it does not have to end at acceptance. We continue them. We continue with the relationship. And I hope this is making sense to you. So how do we foster the bonds? Okay? Mindfully and purposely. One little step at a time. Talk to them. Most bereaved do. They don't often acknowledge because we don't want to seem crazy. But it's healthy. It's comforting to do that. If we have a conversation with someone that we lost and they're not there, we're having it in our minds, sometimes aloud, and it's okay. How many times do you say, I wish you were here? We allow ourselves that, but we don't allow ourselves the, you know what, today I had a bad day. It's the same conversation with the same person. It's the thought. It's the connection that matters. Write to them. One letter, many letters. You can keep them. You can throw them away. Or you can do what a very artistic friend of mine did. She tore them up and she made a beautiful collage with them. Every time she looks, it's a piece of art. Every time she looks at it, she knows exactly what it represents and who it represents. Write a journal. A journal is a really, really a good way of keeping in touch because we write about our not just our loss, but the loss of our dreams, not just of the physical person, but of the goals that we had for that person. And sometimes there is such pain when we journal. And we, if we go back and read it, often we think, I'm stuck, I'm stuck in this grief, I'm depressed again or I'm angry again. But looking back, reading back, will be a measure of just how far we have become, we have come. Adopt a hobby they liked. Might not come easy to you, but try. Finish a project that they had started. Take that trip that they were planning or that they always wanted to take. You take them with you. You have those conversations then. 
plant a tree and nurture it. Celebrate their birthdays, but celebrate their anniversaries. Sounds harsh. How do I celebrate the death of someone I love? Not loved, I love so dearly. But there are such meaningful ways of doing it. I had the honor of meeting a lady who had lost a small child. And on each anniversary of his death, she asks her friends, her colleagues, to do small kinds of small acts of kindness in his memory. I think it's absolutely beautiful. Such a beautiful way of honoring his life. It's not celebrating that he died. It's celebrating that he was here for too short a time, but his life counts. Okay? And the last tip is live your life in a way that will honor the person that you've lost, but again, still very much love. Okay, so those are the continuing bonds. That is the theory of the continuing bond. Then when going back to Kubler-Ross and acceptance at the end, David Kessler is, he, he co-wrote books with his Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and is a man that I greatly admire as an expert in grief. I've read many of his books and I always enjoy them. And he has now written one called The Sixth Stage of Grief, and it is meaning. And I'd encourage every one of you who has lost someone that you miss to read this book. It's, it's very recent. It's called Meaning, The Sixth Stage of Grief. I got mine from Lut. Um, I didn't try exclusive, but I really would encourage you to read it because it's a wonderful book. And it is that step that was missing. And he actually asked permission from the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation to use it as the next step. So what is meaning? Meaning, when we get it, it's about finding a purpose again in life, finding joy in life, despite our loss. And it actually cushions the pain a little. It makes it a little easier to accept that that person is gone, but continues to have meaning in my life. So it's about honoring that person. Again, in the way we live our lives, in the way that we care for ourselves, in the love and compassion that we show others and that we give ourselves to. And it's also looking at them as a whole. Many a times we grieve a part of someone. We grieve 80% or 90 or 60% of someone because we tend to canonize them. We tend to think of them only as these amazing people with great qualities, but we are all human. And when we think of them realistically with the good qualities, the average ones, the ones that were not that great, and allow ourselves then to mourn that real person, we are creating meaning. We're not, create, we're not mourning a canonized version of that person. And it's meaningful. Meaning doesn't have to be a big act. It doesn't have to be setting a scholarship in his or in her name. It can be this. It can be us having these conversations. It can be us supporting each other through loss. Not necessarily the loss of a person, but what we are all suffering right now.
there can be something or there is something as post-traumatic stress growth. And we often focus on the disorder. But when we are able to find meaning in our loss, we will grow from it. We don't have to, but we can. And that's why I love these two theories. It's not about letting go. It's not about moving on. It's about moving forward with the person that we lost. I hope this is helping you. Meaning coupled with purpose equals hope. And that's what we all need when we are grieving. The last slide, probably relieved to hear, is coming up and it's about our coping skills. Because now we've know the factors, we know everything about the behaviors, we know, or some of it at least, we know the theories. So how do we deal with it? And I've put it, our coping skills, they are so important. We need healthy coping skills in every situation in life. Okay. Often they are there, we have not tapped into them, we have not made use of them. So let us look inside and look around us, get all the information we need to cope with our loss. Okay. We need first to learn to manage our expectations and the expectations of others. So I'm feeling so bad. I'm suffering the loss of my routines. I'm suffering being, uh, not being able to go to work because I'm still supposed to work from home. Or all these losses, I am so upset. I'm, I'm actually getting depressed. We, learn to, we need to learn to manage. What are, is my expectation? How am I supposed to feel in this situation? And how do I make my life better within the situation, within or whilst suffering the grief for what I've lost, okay? For every emotional wound, there needs to be tender, loving care. We, we cut ourselves, we put a plaster over it, or we put an ointment over it and look after it until it's better. Our emotional needs need the same loving care. So I put them in three very loose categories, care and compassion, connect and communicate, and trust. And I'm actually going to start with connect and communicate. Honor your feelings, wherever they are. Analyze them and then verbalize them. Talk to a friend. Can be on the phone. Can be just by WhatsApp calls. It can be now we are allowed to have a coffee together. If you are so inclined, do it. But have those conversations. Tell a friend what you need. Don't assume she knows. We expect too much of our friends. We expect them to know exactly what we need. I sometimes needed in my grief someone to talk to. Other times I needed that same person to be with me and say nothing. I just needed that company, that connection, to feel that someone cared enough to be with me in silence. Talk to a counselor or to a therapist, but talk. We've spoken about the journaling already in another context, but do that as well. Journal. How do I honestly feel? Now it's not about the person we lost. It's about how do I feel about the situation? How do I feel about this loss? Put it all down. Write that journal. But I encourage you to get a cheap notebook to do something else. This is what I call my garbage notebook. And it is actually... It's not very nice, but it, it's where we vomit everything into when there are actually no, there is no one around to do it. I put it all down there. That's not something I want to keep. I just put it all down there and then it's thrown away. It's torn up, tear it up and throw it away. 
but it's a very good tool to cope with that overwhelm. There is so much in my mind. There is so much in my heart. Let me just vomit it all out into my garbage notebook. And express your grief creatively. That's also a form of connection to your loved one and others. A hobby. It doesn't have to be a hobby that you have to go out of the house to do. It can be scrapbooking, it can be painting, it can be puzzle making, it can be, Sue referred to me the other day, the diamond dots thing. Wherever it is that works for you, do it if it helps you to feel better. A new hobby, and I referred before about the continuing bond of taking up a hobby that someone you loved used to do, it actually brings great focus and joy to our lives. So I would really encourage you to do that. That's under care, connect and communicate. Then there's the care and the compassion. Do we give to ourselves? Do we afford ourselves the same care and compassion that we so easily give others? Cry. Be compassionate enough to use your tears. Not easy, but we feel so much better afterwards. Get enough rest. That goes without saying we know these things. Are we putting them in practice? Are we creating rituals for our sleep? I know that personally I struggle greatly with that. So you need to pay real attention to that because our bodies need to cope. Make mini breaks or try during the day to do something that you really enjoy. It can be something as easy as sitting with a cup of coffee and a book, but do it. Don't just tell others to do it. Do it yourself. Find moments of peace in each day. There is great healing in stillness. And we are so busy doing, doing, doing that we forget to just be. And to deal with grief and loss, we need to be, not just do. Doing is distracting, but we don't need to always be distracted. We need to connect. And the only way is by using stillness. One skill I like when there is nobody else around is giving myself a good hug. Hugs are so healing. I love hugging. That's one of the things I miss the most about lockdown. It's not being able to hug my friends and my family. So what I do, just bring the knees up. Put your arms around your knees. Squeeze. Rub your arms up and down. It is so soothing, so comforting. It takes away that feeling of fear that we often are connected with. Fear of going out, but resentment for not being able to go out. So do that. Hug yourself every day. Walk in nature. It's very, very grounding. And we all need to be grounded right now. There is this million thoughts in our minds that are so disturbing. We catastrophize continuously. The thoughts in our head, as I said, are often worse than what, it is to come, what is to come. So walking in nature, if you've got a garden, you don't have to go out. If you don't, obviously it's not a possibility, but it's, you know, on the weekends, try to go somewhere we can walk in nature. It does help ground us look at your immune system and the state of it and if if need be use a supplement to help yourself cut yourself some slack parents are under such heavier demands of their time of the energy of everything right now and we want to be everything to everybody Say yes, but say no to. 
Don't feel that because the child is our needs. You know, they, they need our love, our nurturing, our attention. But they also need to know that mom feels worthy enough to take time out for herself and say, right now, for half an hour, it's me time. It's good. Do that. Be flexible. Be loving. Be tolerant. And tolerance is not easy. When we are grieving, when we are in pain, our frustration levels are through the roof and tolerance has gone down the drain. And who do I lose it with? Usually the people that are closest to us. Our wife, our husband, our child, they are the ones that get the brunt of it. In grief, particularly after death, there is often a great disconnect within the couple because the one wants to talk, the other one doesn't. And then that, you know, there is arguments about that. You don't care as much as I do, but maybe the man is keeping quiet because it is so difficult to say, I'm used to fixing things. And the one thing I could fix more than anything else in the world, I was unable to. My sibling or my child is gone. And that side of the male identity that is about being the fixer is so impacted that often it's easy to not talk. But then the partner, the wife, wants to. So communicate. Again, what is my need? What is your need? And how can we both, how can we be tolerant of each other's needs? So please, particular attention to tolerance. Life is bittersweet. But if we take the bitter and the sweet and allow ourselves to feel both, we get balance in life. Lastly, trust. And I'm just looking at the time here and I'm almost finished, I promise you. Trust yourself. Isabel, you can actually take yes. as much time as you need, it's Charmaine. Okay, okay, so I can, okay. thank you Charmaine, because I still no. wanted to touch quickly on the previous one. No, just one, take your time. On the, thank you, on setting aside your guilt, and that's a very important one. Just set it aside. And I'm not talking about death here. If someone says to you, my friend died, it's like, oh my word, how can I feel so bad, so sad that I had a 40th birthday during lockdown and I could not have a big celebration as I had planned? Or that I had to cancel my wedding? There are people worse off. Yes, it's true, but guess what? It is yours. Don't feel guilty for feeling that way. Just hold it. Just say, yo, this really feels bad. I feel terrible about this. I had all these plans. Don't compare. Don't think that somebody's loss is bigger than yours because it is different. Okay? And lastly, the mindfulness. I cannot stress enough the role of mindfulness as a coping skill. Focus in the moment. You don't know what the next moment is going to be like. And it is cliché, but it's true that the previous one is gone. We can do nothing about it. Fix on this moment. Pay attention. Recognize, you know, when we sit still, gently thinking, we can actually then pay attention to the areas in our life that are lacking in stillness and in peace because they will come up when we are quiet. Practice your breathing exercises. I, I followed that link that Melissa sent to me about the, the previous talk, and I loved it. Practice those breathing exercises, those relaxation techniques. Pray, meditate, listen to soothing music. And then I'll go to trust. Trust that you'll be okay. Trust that your heart knows the way 
to healing better than anybody else does. Trust that your life will have purpose and meaning again. You can do this. You will not only be happy, but you can, you will not only survive, but you can be happy and you can be productive again. So to conclude, and it's now, things may not get better in a long, long time. We don't know how long you are going to be living with the fear and the uncertainty. But we will strengthen our coping skills. We will use them. We will see how we can develop new ones. And that will lead us to a resilience that will allow us to live. To live gratefully and to live gracefully despite the losses that we have suffered and that we are suffering constantly. Some say that losing a loved one, when you lose a loved one, a part of you dies with them. I don't think it's a part. I think that sometimes there is a total dissolution, a total shattering of the self. And we will need to use all these coping skills to rebuild any sense of a new life. But that same shattering can be the first step in rebuilding a remarkable life. A journey towards acceptance and healing and meaning. And thank you for listening to me.